Hello there. It's been a while. And it's Christmas season, so Merry Christmas. Thought I'd take the occasion to just do one of my rambles. You know, since I haven't done these in quite a while and it's probably going to be the last one of the year, so one last one before the year ends. So, befitting the occasion, I'd like to talk about the basic Christmas story. You know, the story of the nativity and all, as well as just the entire lore behind Christendom itself, which I'm sure most people are already quite familiar with. But what I want to do is I want to consider them briefly against the backdrop of the great mythological traditions of the world. For me personally, I think some of the considerations that we will go over will help to answer the question of given theism, why Christianity? That is, given that you are already convinced that God exists, why adopt a particularly Christian brand of theism? Let us begin with the concept of a myth. Today we tend to talk about myth, you know, as if it is synonymous with falsehood simply, right? It's just something that's crept into our colloquial language. But not being literally true is only one aspect of what makes a myth a myth. A simple lie that you tell is not a myth in the proper sense of the word. A myth is, you know, it's a story often with foundational and cultural and religious significance is usually imaginative, it is literary, it is colourful, it is sung and chanted and written in verse and reenacted in merriment or in ritual or in ceremony. A myth is a grand thing. It is not something that is simply made up. It is the thing that is born of entire peoples and places. And it encodes, you know, the nuances and, you know, even the subtle wisdoms and truths that is embedded in the collective consciousness of the community. Meta truth. So I don't have time to delve into the details of that here, but if we just take the broad view that there is a greater reality of some sort that is accessible to us via our imagination, a reality in which our most sublime and deepest experience of aesthetic and meaning find its source. The great mythologies of the world can be said to chart humanity's collective course in reaching out and exploring this reality. This reality of shapes and metaphors and patterns in which literal truth is not the point. And so many of our myths, those sourced from starkly different cultures across vast geographical differences, demonstrate these curious repeating patterns. Patterns that to this day still find retelling in our stories, in our movies, and in our games, you know? So back to the Christmas story. Now, perhaps rather curiously, much of the elements of Christian lore echo the repeating patterns found in the great myths that preceded. You know, for example, miraculous virgin birth is an idea that has recurred in various myths. The divine child and the hero's journey are also common archetypal ideas that can be found in the narrative of Jesus' life. The dying God and the whole idea of death and rebirth is something that recurs a lot in the nature religions, something that reflects the cycle of the harvest as well as this haunting idea that things often need to die and be broken and buried in order to be thence made new and golden and beautiful again. Even the Eucharistic wine and the breaking of the bread, being the blood and body of Christ, finds very striking parallel in some old myths. So the whole Christian story rings with the very flavour that have poured forth from the imaginations of diverse ancient cultures, from Ho Chi in the East to Dionysus in the West. What are we to make of this? Should the Christian story be taken less or more seriously given these parallels? Does the fact of the Christian story being peppered with the stuff of these old myths take away from its credibility? I would argue not at all. In fact, quite the opposite. If we suppose that one is already convinced 
of theism of a high-minded and absolute sort. That is, that one has previously been led to think that there is a God, not gods, but God, capital G, Alpha and Omega. Now, an immediate and perhaps somewhat simple-minded impulse might be to then go on to scorn the old myths and the pagan religions that abound with these gods and spirits springing up from every corner of nature and dismiss all of this as you know ancient superstition. Now it is worth noting that this is a kind of hard line position. Effectively you're saying that all of our forefathers were wrong and stupid and our own more philosophical god is real and sterile. But one must wonder if this is really, you know, a reasonable position. Recall that myths are, or at any rate might be, the condensations of collective imagination and wisdom, matured over the ages like fine wine. So a hardline position like this must also scorn imagination itself, and with it our more ethereal intuitions alongside its finest products, things like art and poetry, and stories and song. So that doesn't seem very appealing. One might argue that perhaps if a true religion does exist, it would instead also enfold these wilder and wonderful ideas and somehow bring it in harmony with the cold light of reason and philosophy. And so, this you know, immediately makes Christianity striking in its apparent assimilation of these archetypal and mythical ideas. You know, it has something for the penetrating inquiry of a scholar, but also something for the revelry and the mystery of the exultant ritualist. And what's more interesting is that it makes a significant degree of both compulsory for each. And so, the reveler must study doctrine, and the professor must drink the blood of his god. What is also notable about this is that it also puts paid to the idea that Christianity simply denies its ancestors. You know, that tired charge that among the 3,000 gods out there, only your god is real. I think all proper religion, thought about properly, has been an attempt to reach out to greater reality. And in this, Christianity does not deny the older attempts. It inherits and succeeds in them. What makes the whole thing even more interesting is what we now know about the Gospels. So, you know, with all its essential contents containing so much that is found in mythical tradition, it is perhaps no surprise that some people have thought that perhaps the Gospels themselves are simply a new iteration of myth. This Jesus myth theory is now widely regarded in scholarship as untenable, while the detailed historicity of different parts of the Gospel remains under dispute, of course, it is now generally agreed by scholars that the broad outline, at least, of Jesus' life is historical. And even without relying on this, you know, the details of modern New Testament studies, something about the Gospels have always been somewhat striking. That is, it relates, you know, the, the Jesus story, this story that's so suffused with all these old mythical ideas, in a kind of plain conversational Greek, you know, with a sort of biographer's matter-of-fact tone and lacking in the kind of embellishments or beautiful language, the kind of verse and song and meter that is typical of a real myth. What's more, this whole Jesus story came out of a culture that is rather unique in the ancient world for having a sort of high-minded and almost priggish monotheism. You know, one that aggressively refuses to assimilate the religions of its neighbours. We see hints of it, right, in the behaviour of the Pharisees and the Sadducees in the New Testament. If there was one culture in, you know, the Roman world of the first century that would likely be ignorant of mythology and its various mysteries, it would be the Jews. And so it is, you know, that these simple Jewish evangelists wrote down the Gospel story unimaginatively, seemingly without understanding what they were writing 
without recognizing the patterns. Now, I am not here claiming that any of these considerations prove the factuality of the gospel accounts. Rather, I am pointing out that if ever the stuff written about in the created myths were to enter into history as actual events, then one could reasonably expect the form to be quite like what we find in the Gospels. If there was ever a case of myth becoming fact, the genre of the record we would expect to find would match those of the Gospels. So the long and short of it is that if one is ready, perhaps on separate grounds, to accept the broad factuality of the Gospel accounts, then one would find that it fits into a broader perhaps surprising narrative. It fills in the story, fits in the cornerstone, and completes the picture. And it's a very appealing picture of the ultimate nature of all things. And you know, we can even taste a bit of it for ourselves this season, this Christmas season, you know, when the merry songs and the church services are in full swing. It is a good time to remember the soul of the festival and experience and confirm for ourselves the resonant appeal of some of these ideas that are embedded in them. These ideas that have inspired songs and hymns for 2,000 years. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? The very idea of the Incarnation gives body to the abstract concept of God's love for us. How shall we know that God loved us? He was born for us. He was flogged for us. He died for us. Can any abstract, non-physical, non-temporal idea strike into the human soul the way that these words do? Because of Christmas, because of Jesus, our love and gratitude to God has a place to stand on. Let me conclude, let me end by quoting a passage from my favourite author C.S. Lewis from his chapter called The Grand Miracle. Does not the Christian story show this pattern of descent and reascent? because that is part of all the nature religions of the world? Is not this one more instant of the same thing, the dying God? Well, yes, it is. That is what makes the question subtle. When I first, after childhood, read the Gospels, I was full of that stuff about the dying God, the golden bow, and so on. It was to me then a very poetic and mysterious and quickening idea. And when I turned to the Gospels, never will I forget my disappointment and repulsion at finding hardly anything about it at all. You had a dying God, who was always representative of the corn. You see him holding the corn, that is bread, in his hand and saying, this is my body. And from my point of view, as I then was, he did not seem to realize what he was saying. Surely there, if anywhere, this connection between the Christian story and the corn must have come out. The whole context is crying out for it. But everything goes on as if the principal actor, and still more those about him, were totally ignorant of what they were doing. Why was it that the only case of the dying God, which might conceivably have been historical, occurred among a people, and the only people in the whole Mediterranean world, who had not got any trace of this nature religion, and indeed seemed to know nothing about it? Well, that is almost inexplicable, except on one hypothesis. How if the corn king is not mentioned in that book, because he is here, of whom the corn king was an image. How the representation is absent, because here at last the thing represented is present. If the shadows are absent, because the thing of which they were shadows is here. Now, I would recommend anyone intrigued by what I have touched on in this ramble to check out the full text of this chapter, which nowadays, fortunately, has been recorded into a very nice video full of doodle visual aids that I heartily recommend. So I will link it here, I think. So do check it out, I recommend it, it's a very good video. Meanwhile, thank you as always for listening, and uh, I hope you have a very Merry Christmas, and. Here's to a great and 
in fact, better year uh, 